So I would say let's uh, go and start right ahead. So we have a lot of uh, things to talk about today. So I will uh, just give you a quick overview about the agenda. So first, I want to start like with my definition of gamification and serious games, uh, since we know that there are a lot of different authors out there that use these uh, terms in another way, but uh, I want to specify how I understand it. Um, then I will quickly give you an overview about the process, like how I normally um, do these kind of projects, the, the project overview on the experience design or experience management. Then um, it goes really into the topics, the case studies, the examples of gamification and serious games in international cooperation in different countries and um, followed by an impact measurement discussion that I want to open up and of course also uh, followed by an open Q&A. Um, since currently I don't have an uh, eye on the chat, it would be great if you could uh, um, kindly, uh, perhaps Agnesa, um, gather these questions and then have it in the open Q&A at the end. So all these questions we're trying to tackle at the end. But before I start with an input, I want to also uh, give you a tool at hand that me personally, I like a lot and that you can do, of course, on an optional uh, basis. I call it the uh, personal session lock uh, consisting of four squares, basically. Uh, depends if you are more preferring doing these things uh, on a digital or analog way. The left hand side, what you can see here is these four um, quadrants with methods, all these things that you in the next 60 minutes, not only from my side, but also from your peers, from the others that you find interesting, you can note down in that area, methods, processes, tools, all these things, then ideas that you personally have that might raise uh, from your thinking, you know, like we trigger now thinking from your end, and this will uh, result in ideas from your part, perhaps for projects, for new projects, for, I don't know, perhaps um, some things that you want to implement in some of your projects, whatever it might be. So this is for your ideas. Then on the bottom left, this area you see uh, as nuggets, what I call it, nuggets or insights, you know, like things that you really don't want to forget. Um, uh, things that you want to take away, basically, you know, interesting aspects. Um, and then also like this debrief aspect where it could be like questions that you might have, but not only questions, but also, you know, a push for activity, things that perhaps you want to do in the future, some things that you want to dive a bit deeper into it or group up with your team, you know, anything that uh, serves as a follow up for this. So either you go for a, on a digital way or as I normally do it because humans like to work with their hands and also for the learning, uh, I prefer this personally. So I just, you know, take a paper and just do a cross on it, have this mind on it and here we go. So that's just an option, um, a, a tool for you to take away the most of this session. Let's go. Gamification versus serious games. So what do I understand by gamification? What do, what do I understand by serious games? So here's like one, um, of course, one very famous um, yeah, definition, the use of game elements in non-game context. And I like uh, easy definitions. However, I am working normally with this one that I modified a little, uh, slightly. Like for me, I understand a gamified system as an analog and or digital environment enriched by game elements to nudge users towards a desired set of activities. So this means that um, we are not, we are here trying to the separation between serious games, so really a game that is, you know, a simulation, really a closed environment with this uh, gamified aspect, really like learning from games and not playing games. So we try to enrich the reality by game elements, in other words. And what you can see here on the left hand side is one picture from uh, from Frankfurt Airport, uh, where where you can, you know, <laughs> where they in, enriched uh, this experience of waiting for your luggage on the one hand, but also, of course, doing uh, marketing purposes for their uh, casino next door. So uh, this year is uh, the reality enriched by any kind of game elements. Then also on the bottom left, you see these zombies run, which is also a digital um, application, but 
also kind of um, yeah is a mixture of, of digital and the analog world so therefore I'm not doing the distinction between analog and digital gamified systems um, and normally the user says you know when I give uh, him or her a gamified system then the user says I currently do not play a game well um, do I perhaps play a game i don't know so this is quite often what you experience like when you ask your users uh, <clears throat> of a gamified system if they play a game because at the beginning this experience does not feel like playing a game because we all know these different definitions of what makes a game a game and um in gamified uh, gamification as i understand it is the reality could be analog or digital enriched by game elements on the other hand, we have serious games. Here on the left-hand side, you see a picture of um, a piece uh, game that we created for Yemen. So uh, that's a project that I will uh, talk about in a few minutes. But here is like the initial uh, definition is a game designed for primary purpose other than pure entertainment. And this one, I really like this designed for a primary purpose, because this means that serious games are not, you know, does not need to be boring or something like this, or entertainment is excluded. No, it is included, but the primary purpose, why we are realizing this game is another than pure entertainment. So as I understand it, a serious game serves as an environment for intended learning, awareness raising or behavior change without direct consequences in the real world. So the first one that is perhaps interesting here is this intended learning, meaning that we really want the player to learn something, for instance. So of course, in every game that you know, also in, um, in entertaining games, people learn things. Yeah? But here we are, here we want to uh, direct their learning towards a certain direction. And we also have no consequences, no direct consequences in the real world means like, if you're a game designer, you know this word of this magic circle. In this magic circle, you can do things without consequences in the real world. You can try out to be someone else. And here a player would say, yes, I am playing a game currently, or I'm playing a game right now. Oh, this is a serious game. What is a serious game again? You know, like people do not need to be aware of playing a serious game, but they will be aware that they are playing a game. Yeah? So that's, for me, a distinction, the distinction that a serious game is intended um, to serve another purpose other than pure entertainment. And a gamified system, on the other hand, is really like the, uh, the reality enriched by game elements. And here, um, this is the magic circle again of serious games that I was uh, talking um, about a few seconds ago. So in the middle, you see that we do not have consequences in the real world. The learner on the left hand side can enter this magic circle, can try and fail, and try also to be someone else. But of course, these consequences do not lead to direct impact in the real world. But these activities and these learnings, awareness raising, behavior change aspects that are triggered here, they definitely have like indirect uh, impact on the real world because these learnings that are done in this magic circle will be transferred into real life. All right. Uh, this is also, you know, um, something that you probably know, like we have here these three circles, like gamification, serious games and entertainment games. Uh, gamification I see as environments enriched by game elements or the, the reality, it doesn't matter if it's the analog or digital reality enriched by game elements. The serious games are games with a primary purpose other than pure entertainment and entertaining games like people, uh, sorry, games to entertain people. Also, of course, sometimes it's not 100% clear if we're already in a serious game, if it's still a gamified system, or if it's a serious game, entertainment game, sometimes it's not 100% sharp. That's why these circles are also overlapping. But in general, for me, it makes sense um, as a practitioner, as someone who designs gamified systems and someone who designs serious games, it makes sense to have this distinction and I want to share this with you. Let's continue. Next one is um, the process. 
like how do I normally set up um, these projects in international cooperation, just to give you an overview um, how this is done. Normally, definitely, we start with an analysis. So this is a step that seems to be obvious and seems to be, yes, everyone is doing it, but in reality and in fact, a lot of people are skipping this phase one analysis. You really need to understand the target group and the context you are designing your game or gamified system for. And this is really key in order to get a success and also to compete with other triple A titles with other budgets um, that you know the entertaining industry has. So really understand the context and the target group, understand the culture uh, that you're working in. And you will see what I mean in the upcoming um, examples that I show you. Then uh, this analysis, this extensive analysis is followed by a design phase or conceptualization phase um, where this gamified system or the serious game is yeah, conceptualized. And uh, in this phase also normally what you do is you try to bring on the one hand this objectives that you have as you know, learning objectives, awareness raising, behavior change, triggers, whatever you might have on the project uh, targets on the one hand, and on the other hand, bringing together the a fun experience, you know, the game design, and basically marry these two, the, uh, the project of objectives and the fun experience of the user and bring them together to create something, yeah, uh, enjoyable that is also fulfilling your purposes and achieving your targets at the same time. This design phase is followed by, of course, the development. Uh, these things need to be, you know, coded. Uh, this uh, art uh, need to be created and stuff like this depends on the gamified system or the serious game. Of course, this development also follows it needs a lot of testing, you know, quick prototypes, uh, test these with paper, paper prototypes and then try and improve, iterate, test with the target group and so on and so forth. Then we are going for the implementation, promotion, really like the publication on it. But we do not only put like these games into the store and also not only, you know, supporting them with promotion campaigns online and offline, but we are also, you know, what really want to implement these things in companies, for instance, at schools, um, hospitals, wherever um, it might apply. And then, of course, the evaluation. However, this evaluation here stands at the end. Perhaps you recognize the ADI model that is behind us. So analysis, design, development, implementation, evaluation, ADI. However, of course, evaluation already takes place at the very beginning of the project. And uh, also in the design phase, when we, when we later talk about impact measurement systems, um, the evaluation already needs to be taken into consideration at the very beginning of the project. Also, uh, since we're here in a sustainable um, symposium, handover is very important, especially in international cooperation. Sometimes things are just, you know, produced because we want to generate numbers. And then after one or two or three months, uh, these things might die because I do not take care anymore of it. So this product cycle ends super fast. No, we need to have like also a proper handover and like a future uh, of this project of this gamified system or the serious game. So also keep into consideration the handover from the very beginning, who will be owning this product at the end. And this is uh, some of the approaches, or these are some of the approaches, sorry, um, that I use uh, here. So I call it, or I subsumize it under the term of experience management. Um, so I start always with a lot of design thinking, really to get to the core of the user, to understand the culture, the context, and also really understand the problem that normally the donor organization in international cooperation wants to solve, wants to achieve. And this design thinking phase um, is basically bridging from the problem space to the solution space. Perhaps you heard these two terms, you know, problem space first. And then if you really defined the problem, understood the target group, understood the context, then you can hand it over to the ideation phase, to the solution space. And this is where, <clears throat> sorry, in gamification and serious games, we have this serious game design, gamification design, but it's also um, complemented by usability and experience design because all these aspects, all these approaches are very um, connected. <clears throat> it is followed um, also then by agile project management. So once 
we designed the game, then we need to produce it, you know, like the development, we work together with different studios, uh, game development studios in order to achieve these measures and to really bring them to life. So agile project management, normally I'm using a mixture of Scrum and Kanban, um, whatever fits the team best I'm working with. So just this is uh, the overview about the process, but how does it look like in reality? Um, sorry, forget this slide before we get into the reality. Um, in the design phase, I will not go into detail on these because I'm quite sure you're aware of most or probably of all of them. You can see here are like frameworks, approaches um, that are yeah, well known in the gamification world. Um, the flow theory, of course, the Octalysis framework by Chow, the self-determination theory by Dickey and Ryan. Um, behaviorism and so on and so forth all these things that we that we are using in the design phase in order to find the right composition of extrinsic and intrinsic motivators i will not go into detail on these things because i know you're aware of these this these we use in the design phase but then uh, let's see how it looks um in action now so we forgot also this slide because that's also quite an important one i think it's the context zoom um this is uh in um one yeah one mini framework that i uh published in with my phd so this was um one working in international cooperation when working for development cooperation you need to take uh these different levels these different zoom levels into consideration so if you zoom out like humans are you know very uh, equal to each other we have these human psychological core drives that more or less are similar in each one of us but then if we really want to you know design a product for a certain um yeah target group for a certain culture we need to zoom in and understand you know how does this culture work how is the social interaction in this culture is working then zooming in within that culture within you know this context within that culture in the country the target group you know it's a difference if we want to create a game for kids or for ceos of, of an energy company for instance you know there we also need to zoom in in the target group and zooming in and this last step is also quite often uh lost in reality is the use case so really design a game and think of like how does this place or space looks like where people will interact with your system it's a huge difference if you are designing an intervention a system that people are forced to play in a training environment or if they should play it from their um, way to work to to the uh, to their homes in the bus in the crowded bus for instance in a developing uh, country yeah so this use case where will the people and how does this situation looks like uh, where people will um, interact with your system this is also an important one and now we're finally here <laughs> now uh, we get to to the core of this um, input gamification and serious games in international cooperation so how um, um, how do we realize it i brought you some examples um, i think all of them are from GIZ, but um, yeah we do not only have like uh, projects for GIZ, but also with the un world bank friedrich ebert stiftung and so on so but these are just some uh, samples some some examples also and um, this is how it started. It started uh, when I was working for GSZ, so German Development Cooperation Agency, and um, I worked in a digital, um, yeah, for a team that works on digital learning all over the world, so supporting different projects all over the world on digital learning scenarios. And I came across, okay, how can we make these um, digital learning scenarios more exciting because like they were kind of stuck in the 90s just clicking and clicking and no interaction with no real interaction with the user and then you know I discovered the topic of gamification and serious games directly felt in love with it and also recognized that I was doing this already my entire life um, on an intuitive basis but then I decided to yeah, write my PhD about this gamification series games in international cooperation. And um, at the beginning, it was really hard to convince um, 
people, also the ministry, to um, combine tax money with games <laughs> for development cooperation. So this was not um, not really known a few years ago, and uh, but sooner or later, with small projects, you know, we started it uh, became more successful, and then 2015. We had our first big kickoff in Ethiopia, uh, where we had a, a hackathon for social good, like gamification for social good. And um, yeah, this was basically the, the beginning, the first um, spotlight um, project in the German Development Corporation working on gamification and serious games. And um, now, like six years later, or almost seven years later, um, we also realized uh, more projects, and I will start with the first one in Afghanistan. So welcome to uh, the forest landscape restoration project. So these things um, that I will tell you now uh, took place before August 2021, right? So you know that there was a huge uh, change uh, in the country in August. And um, therefore, these, these measures that I tell you um, were before it, but it's still valid. And um, yeah, we will see how we continue um, with it. However, it's still a very interesting um, use case, an example of gamification in a very um, tough context. So uh, GIZ uh, realized it. It was funded by the um, Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development. And uh, yeah, the project is called Forest Landscape Restoration, and the objective is ecological and productive functions of degraded forest landscapes have been restored in five provinces in Afghanistan. So these provinces were Badakhshan, Khost, Paktia, Samangan, and Hakka. And um, yeah, there were a lot of different stakeholders involved, um, local NGOs, communities, and so on and so forth. And what did we do in this with this forest landscape restoration? So on the one hand, we really um, um, worked in the field and uh, yeah, supported the communities in achieving these targets that I gave, uh, that I just um, explained to you. But of course, I was focusing with this gamification on the capacity building activities, on the training measures for the project. So. But how do we do a digital, a gamified digital learning scenario in a country like Afghanistan? We came up with a nice story, and this is, I will just give you quickly an overview. The story is then also represented in the different modules in this learning course. So welcome to the fictitious learning village Abada Mondi. And uh, we created this together with different uh, consultants and experts um, all over the world. Um, working on reforestation, especially having experiences in Afghanistan. So this learning village, um, this fictitious learning village, basically you enter this at the beginning of the course and you get to know the different people that are working, um, not that are working, sorry, that are living in it. So we have uh, Haji Shah, for instance, like the, the wise people here in the village and uh, his wife Ayla Zahair. We have um, other characters, um, for instance, that I call like the little birds, like the spies that provide you with new information that uh, take place to make the story more dense, to make it more realistic and provide you, you know, with also um, pieces of information from the streets, let's call it like that. And yeah, so the first module basically gives you the introduction into that um, fictitious village and um, also faces you with the reality because this is how it looks like currently in Afghanistan. We do not have any intact forests. However, everything that you see here should be green. Uh, so we have a huge problem with the deforestation. Of course, um, we have a lot of different regions. They have, you know, like they are always uh, suffering from wars uh, in the past. And also we have heavy winters or very, very cold winters, and they need to basically do fire to not, um, yeah, to not freeze and, and stuff like this. So we have a lot of different, I don't want to go too much into detail on it, but we do not have any intact forests here. And this is like the reality that we are facing and we need to change this. So uh, we have different learning modules. The first one is basically in the introduction into the story, into the setting, and then it continues with the inclusive development and community integration. In the story, uh, you have like two competing villages and the first uh, village 
uh, is the village that you are living in and the other you know, is your competitor. And the village that you are living in has a, a consultant who uh, tells you about the inclusive development and community integration, also gender aspects. And you are performing better during, you know, the progression in the course. Why? You see on the left-hand side, a result of um, a irrigation canal that you have without women included in the planning. And on the right hand side, you see an irrigation canal that included the women in the planning. Okay, and I think um, the difference here is quite obvious. Here we have like an easy access to it because this is normally the job that is done by the women. However, planned by men. Yeah, and therefore what you can see here is um, if you you know need to wash your clothes or get the water from the irrigation canals, uh, basically here we have like a nice shadow place with a step to the channel uh, to the can uh, irrigation canal. Sorry, and um, yeah, so that's you know quite an interesting uh, difference what you can do by um, by just yeah including here women in the planning of this irrigation canal. Here, another one, then um, we will, there are a lot of different examples on it and how you can do this and how can you incorporate and establish this kind of um, gatherings with men, uh, male and female uh, inclusion here. And what we have then, it leads over to the next module, the climate change adaptation and disaster risk management. What happens then in the story is that there's a huge catastrophe and this huge catastrophe is almost uh, destroying the other village. People come to your village and ask, you know, for your support from this competitive um, other village, and you need to, you know, include them in the process. And there will be, you know, messages of conflict um, resolution, nonviolent conflict transformation. And here, combined with this big module on climate change adaptation and disaster risk management, and this is a real outcome out of the project. You see like one area in Balakshan before and after um, the, the project activities took place. So these are the real, um, what you can see is, you know, we can also here fight erosion and gather the rain that is, that is here, um, planting trees and all these activities, you know, um, these training activities go hand in hand with real actions in the field. This is uh, the, um, the learning platform where the courses, these blended learning experiences are taking place. Here you have um, the module on gender or inclusion. Um, this is a platform called Atingi by uh, GIZ. And there we have a lot of different learning courses on different topics. This one here now is in the language Dari uh, for Afghanistan. And uh, these are just some results out of the project. So in 2020 established uh, 193 nurseries. What you can also see here is that um, Afghan women are allowed or were allowed here also to work <clears throat> in the backyard uh, and uh, also to establish these three nurseries. We have uh, 4,000 people uh, trained in forest landscape restoration. What you can see here is also that we have here the a women gathering um, and they are planning here also these irrigation canals that you can see in the middle. Um, we rehabilitated six kilometers of irrigation canals, paid 90,000 labor days to villagers, established 70 village groups for forest landscape restoration. Also what you can see here is like the, the mix of um, men and women. And um, but, you know, these are very uh, nice results, I would say, but I, of course, don't only want to, to tell you, you know, the good things about what, what came out of it, but me personally, I also had a lot of learnings out of it because this was a very challenging or is still a very challenging context. And for you, just as a takeaway, there are some lessons learned that you can also take away from this project. So first of all, storytelling works. Um, especially, of course, in this Afghan culture where a lot of learning and um, delivering messages, delivering knowledge is done through storytelling, um, especially in this context, it, it works, but it, I never saw a context where it does not work. Yeah, So storytelling works, <clears throat> then 
intrinsic it's just a way like also how humans uh, love to learn and you know storytelling and gamification are super much linked to each other in my opinion um intrinsic motivation for learning really be careful with putting too many extrinsic motivators to a system because uh, this will this will trigger the over justification effect um, where you basically kill intrinsic motivation with extrinsic motivators then of course keep the limitations in mind in a context like afghanistan it's really hard um, to really work on a digital way that is only relying on digital aspects of course you need to again here we are in the use case in the first pilot phase when we uh, did the project there we had uh, people that were gathering around you know like 10 people who were gathering around like one pc listening to the <coughs> sorry listening to the flr experts so we have to keep the limitations in mind but at the same time there's also this use case of having a lot of different people around one device <clears throat> can also lead to positive outcomes because then the people afterwards will talk about what they just heard start with a slim magic circle don't overtax um, a culture that is not used to learn um, in this gamified way with points badges um yeah uh, virtual currencies and stuff like this don't overtax them with too many elements it's not needed you know just start with their own culture and see what you can do in order to enrich uh, the already existing learning culture a little bit to just nudge uh, their their learning um, and their awareness raising towards a certain direction so start slim and see what you what you can do really um to to add on this you know just a few pieces might be enough already and of course contextualize it uh, to the culture this goes to for all the projects but this is super important please uh, just a quick reminder of this context zoom that i showed you at the beginning there is one one dimension is the culture itself all right so for the next steps we will um we have to wait first and see what happens um, but probably it might be that we are continuing with uh, some gamified blended learnings for local field staff and communities and having one integrative system as a next steps in combination with a serious game on reforestation and climate change so that they can basically make use of uh, these these two different systems that we will you know combine as one integrated system however again this is not decided there. We do not have a final decision yet. We have to be careful and see how the current situation evolves. All right. <clears throat> Next uh, project I want to bring to you. I see I have to be careful with time and speed up a little bit. But let's talk about gamification and serious games in Egypt briefly. Um, in our book, uh, Transforming Society and Organizations Through Gamification, we also have my dear colleague Nina Gali, who uh, works for the Labor Market Access Project. And it's really nice if you have this book, please uh, check out also his chapter. And there he describes like the different um, serious games that were created um, in, co in cooperation with the Information Technology Institute, uh, ITI in Cairo, Egypt to work on the challenges of the blue color labor market in Egypt. And there are like different over 10 serious games were created and also an own serious game track in this post university was established in cooperation from uh, GZ and ITI. So I don't want to go into detail because that's his topic. I also uh, supported in it, but you know, um, I don't want to go too deeply into that one, but give you another example from Egypt that, um, yeah, that that I want to bring to you today. It's from a serious game from the Strengthening Reform Initiatives in the Public Administration short strip um, <coughs> project, sorry, which basically works um, or is a serious game on human rights in Egypt. And what we did here, we created a story and uh, in this story, we have like five, um, five different characters. We will choose like the different perspectives and first start playing as uh, one person, then after one chapter playing as another person, going through different decisions along our way. <coughs> Sorry again. 
and um, <clears throat> collecting these on the uh, bottom right hand side, you see the different palettes of um, human rights. So you will collect the different human rights and um, understand what is behind it and how you can use it also then uh, in the game, but always we kick out then from time to time the player to reflect in the real world to see, okay, what are their kind of human rights? How can you make use of it? How can you find them? How can you report if you see a result on human rights? And basically, you know, what can you do to empower the people um, to make use of their human rights? Then we have another example <clears throat> from uh, Vietnam. This is again a gamified system, so a gamified learning experience for energy efficiency in Vietnam. Sorry, I don't know what's with my throat today. But this one is a gamified learning course on energy efficiency and energy saving potentials for industries. So what you can see here is it gives you, it, is, it consists of different modules on energy management, for instance, heating and insulation, ventilation and air conditioning, motor drives and pumps, lighting and so on and so forth. And um, we have this content that is very technical and also perhaps a little bit dry. And we wanted to improve it and improve this learning experience. Okay, so we wanted to improve this learning experience through gamification. And that is why we came up with another story. So we have an own fictitious company that we are working in. And on the bottom left, you can see uh, the CEO of this fictitious company you're working in. And he introduces you to a competition that uh, takes place among different companies worldwide uh, on energy efficiency and you should win this competition. We see that we implement, what you can see here is that we you know, recorded different uh, interviews and we have basically a role play, like the illusion of a real company, you know, from the weaving and then finance department and so on and so forth. And you have to interact with the different uh, people and convince them and realize energy efficiency measures in your fictitious company. We also give you a tan at the very beginning, like this, this guiding avatar that we called Lena. So she is an expert um, on energy efficiency and she is guiding you through this gamified learning course. And there are some perhaps interesting highlights of this course um, that we are proud of. For instance, this one is a nice takeaway for all the participants um, as a gamified personal learning log. So as mentioned, this energy efficiency topic is highly technical with a lot of calculations. Sorry, that is the difference on a stage and in the home office. The doorbell rang, so I will ignore it. So here's the thing. One takeaway is this takeaway, sorry, one takeaway is this gamified personal learning look. And um, what we can see here is that at the beginning of the course, you download this learning look and um, it guides uh, while progressing in the course itself, you will unlock the different sheets in this, um, in this learning log and you will get access to new tools for calculation of the different um, energy efficiency potentials. Yeah? So you can also see that on the one hand, you will unlock new tools for, for calculation, but also you see that you unlock achievements here. And these achievements then are feeding your fictitious company that you can customize and create on your own. So at the beginning of the, co <clears throat> of the course, it is very um, yeah, empty that you can see here. And at the end of the course, you know, like you can individualize all these things once you unlock, you know, these energy efficient windows or whatever, like the compressed air systems and so on and so forth, uh, which is really a lot of fun within the limitations of an Excel sheet that you can afterwards take away and use it in your own company to, to do these calculations and combine the learning with experiences. Uh, yeah, we created over 50 assets for that, that you can individualize. And some results on this, <coughs> sorry, is we kicked it off uh, uh, yeah, uh, in November and we had already more than 250 participants and over 120 finished the course. And this is really a heavy course. This is really like 
um, with yeah, a highly technical course with kind of you know dry, boring content, but you know we have a huge or a very good um, completion rate for it. Uh, we had participants from Vietnam, India, Mongolia, Bangladesh, Nepal, and of course different European countries. Um, and you know this was just the first kickoff, and further implementations will follow. The next example that I brought. Uh, to you, okay, 20 minutes left, is serious games for, uh, serious games, sorry, for the tourism sector for sustainable development in Africa. Okay, so one year ago, um, together with two colleagues, I wrote a game design document on this one. We went through the analysis phase and the design phase, um, working on a serious game to, you know, support um, sustainable tourism all over Africa. And I am uh, happy to pronounce that 10 months later, uh, through the great um, cooperation through Mali, uh, Malio Games, Uziko Games, Leti Arts, Kaifo, yeah, and my own company, Mind Games, uh, we realized this game now finally, and this week it will be published in the store, so you will be one of the first ones seeing these pictures. So it's the first Pan-African series game creation with these great studios that you can see here in the center. Um, it works on entrepreneurship education for sustainable tourism all over Africa, and learning contents are, among others, sustainable tourism, price building, spoilage, seasonality, investment, stock management. So basically what they are trying or what we are trying to achieve here is to support um, people who are working in the tourism sector, especially like um, sellers of these um, souvenir shops, you know, as a first round. Um, to, to learn about these different basics <clears throat> of entrepreneurship education. The game is designed in the first phase for these, you know, um, owners of tourism shops uh, who's, that sells, um, yeah, these, these kind of um, uh, souvenirs, but it can be also upscaled and also then adapted to other sectors. This is how, uh, for instance, the game looks like. So you can choose your, <clears throat> your player, your shopkeeper, male or female. Uh, you, have, you will collect and gather different insights on the customer-oriented thinking. Um, you will learn about investments. You will also um, get the connection to this Atingi platform that I mentioned in another project which is this digital learning platform by the uh, GIZ German Development Corporation Agency and learn entrepreneurship skills. So what happens if, for instance, if you're uh, setting a price in the game itself and putting it too high, then you get a notification, hey, do you want to check it out how it works in real life? And then you uh, will be kicked out to that platform, can do a course, then you can do a course on um, uh, yeah, on price building, basically, that takes you one hour, you get a certificate at the end. On the certificate itself, there will be a, uh, a code that you can then insert in the game itself, and this code will then unlock, you know, legendary items. Um, yeah, this is uh, then, you know, it kicks you then to that course, and we always have this cross promotion from the real learning courses to that serious game. So it will be always, you know, um, promoting each other. And um, yeah, this will be published um, this week, most probably tomorrow, but let's see <laughs> how these things are going. But yeah, I'm really looking forward to that because this, this is, um, is a big thing. All right, um, this is the last example that I brought you today. It is about serious games in Yemen. So we have a country in civil war. We have almost 20 million people that are in need of humanitarian assistance. That is 70% of the overall population. Uh, population sorry. <clears throat> and uh, 17 million are food insecure, we have the civilian infrastructure is, uh, this one is largely destroyed. Of course, in combination with COVID-19, you can imagine um, how the situation looks like right now. And we also have ongoing fights in several regions, protests, shutdowns, and so on and so forth. Um, if you are aware of the current situation, you know that we have a um, huge conflict in the country. 
Okay, what uh, did we do in the past years to trying to support um, here? And this is the Arabia Felix team. So this is a team consisting of um, yeah, uh, GIZ employees on the one hand, but also consultants from uh, Europe, uh, Netherlands, like Butterfly Works did a great job here in establishing it. But also we have, of course, most of our people um, that we, who we are working with are based in Yemen, so are Yemenis. Um, and what we can see here are the different Yemeni teams working on our serious games for peace, because we wanted to create serious games that all of these games you can always download for free, right? And uh, we wanted to create serious games for different target groups. So for kids on the one hand, then for youth, young adults, um, to deliver a message of peace and nonviolent conflict transformation. And yeah, what uh, as a result, we created uh, seven, I think the eighth one is now uh, on the run, on the publishing edge, let's call it like that, uh, seven serious games. Uh, what you can see here are different approaches, ga different game approaches that you, obviously uh, the top center one is more for children on the education aspect. On the left-hand side, you can see a point and click adventure where you go through a fictitious village that is combining the different regions all over Yemen um, to, to deliver a message of you know, um, disarmament, peaceful coexistence and nonviolent conflict transformation. Um, yeah, then the empowerment of women, rebuilding structures, doing decision-making and so on and so forth. So different game approaches and different games. And um, just as a few results, we had over 80,000 downloads of these games um, that were mainly, I think, 95% out of Yemen, uh, over 60,000 followers on social media. Then a result that was not intended by us was the foundation of a game studio not cal um, called Acadia Studio. And this is, I think, a great success because imagine you know a, a country of civil war and you have a lot of different conflicts and no existing uh, no working infrastructure and you know a group of young uh, coder male and female um, they came together to create to found the studio and to to uh, really work on serious games for peace on their own and um, yeah that was exceptional and really a great outcome then um, these games were supported by a lot of different online and offline activities, you know, like painting contests in schools, also a tangible um, um, a game box, basically, we call it the box of joy that you get that we delivered to schools and hospitals over there, um, where they had you, you know, like different uh, a comic was inside, then a, a board game of the of the serious game then uh, QR code stickers and so on and so forth. And for the kids and for the children there, that was really nice. Uh, different digital learning courses, filming events took place. Um, people were speaking about these games on radio shows and on YouTube. And um, we established the, or we realized the first game hackathon in Yemen. And two weeks ago, the, the second one took place. Um, yeah. So this, these are just some of the results and checking uh, the time. This is the last thing I want to, um, to kick off for now and then followed. Uh, I'm really looking forward to also get in contact with you and discuss uh, different aspects, different questions that you might have. But before that results, um, how do we do impact measurement? So. Here are different tools um, or different types of impact measurement that I try, depending on the project, trying to implement. And this, these can for you also serve if you are designing a game. These are handy things that you can apply and use um, for your own impact measurement system if you are designing a game. So I think the first one, and this the, or probably also the most obvious one, are kind of you know hard numbers of facts, um, like the amount of downloads, active installations, different devices, and all these things that you can check out in the back end of the Play Store at the beginning when I was checking out this, uh, uh, the back end of the Play Stores, I was scared what 
we can all see <laughs> here. So um, here's already a lot of data that you can, of course, um, uh, check on. Perhaps one, if we're talking about data, of course, it is super important at the very beginning and to, to also include it, incorporate in the design that you are following um, data uh, security um, and privacy guidelines. Yeah, so the GDPR um, are always part here um, of, of our projects. So uh, then if it's a gamified system, for instance, a gamified learning course, then you can also check the numbers on the participation, on the certificates, on the ratings, and so on and so forth. In serious games, you can also incorporate different game analytics functions and functionalities. How many people decide for this option? How many people decide for that option? Um, how fast are they progressing in the game? You know, different things that you want to capture in the game uh, that you can also afterwards use uh, to measure the impact and basically see uh, how uh, check on their behavior in the game. Then what we are also doing is questionnaires. So we include these questionnaires in the game. So we have pre and post questionnaires and longitudinal questionnaires. So before playing the game or in the first hour of playing the game, then after playing the game um, or reaching a certain level where we say, okay, now like all the important learning content is there. So now uh, we go for a post questionnaire and then also three months after the uh, post questionnaire, there comes another one with the longitudinal questionnaire. But to be fair and to be realistic, this longitudinal questionnaire does not really work so far because like we're um, giving out the games to a lot of different uh, people and just a few people um, have like this game three months installed on their device, you know, probably you know it from yourself, if it's not Candy Crush, then you will download a game, play it, play it through, and then delete it afterwards. So you will not keep it after you played it like for three months on your device. So this longitudinal questionnaire is in theory nice, <laughs> but in practice, hmm, let's see. Um, perhaps uh, it will change with the new game. So then we also, um, or I come up with something called real life challenges. Um, there we kick out the player out of the magic circle and we want them to apply the learning in real life. Meaning uh, imagine a game about education in Yemen and we tell like different good environments for learning in the game and then you know there's one task in the game that kicks the player out of this magic circle and asks them or her of course um what are the three things that you could do in your own school to improve the learning environment you know and this now the person reflects on the stuff that he or she learned in the magic circle and reflect on it and applies it to his or her own context and tries to put it even if it's just in thoughts, to their school. And then we see, ah, okay, yeah, so this learning content fits, could fit here, yeah. And then we, of course, want them to submit certain things, you know, just a, a few bullet points. And then we can, with this, we can quantify at least a hint of awareness raising. Yeah. So people reflect on the content, put it in thoughts to the real world to their real scenario and then they have to submit um you know these the, their solutions you know in a very easy way and this this these submissions we can quantify we can measure and these therefore we can you know also quantify these these awareness raising aspects then another possibility another uh, system are the in-game experiments and you can by uh, randomized put people um, in different groups. So within the game, if you are installing the game, you don't know that you're in group A, B, or C. You know that just the, the game uh, gives you one uh, one one letter. And as group A, you get additional information A. As group B, you get additional information B in the game. And then group C is the testing group. And then, for instance, we ask them, okay, the your neighbor village was destroyed. Will you help and support them? Yes or no? And then we can also see, that was just a very easy example, how does this change their decisions in the game, you know, depending on what kind of information they received. Then we also have um, perhaps one last word on the in-game experiment. This functionality is not only an in-game experiment, but it's still in the experimental phase, right? Because we all know that if we are in the magic circle, we 
try to be someone else, we are not behaving like we would in the real world. Therefore, we have to be super careful in order to really measure these decisions in the game and extrapolate them basically to the real world and say, okay, these are bad people because they are playing as bad guys in the game, right? This is, of course, um, there you have to be very careful with the data that you collect and bring it into the context of a game environment still. And then we also um, can measure different aspects of cross promotion. So data numbers on other platforms. I showed you, you know, like some projects were supported by this learning platform called Atingi. And there we can, uh, of course, also measure uh, the activity there, the numbers. Um, of course, you can also have, you know, social media fan pages where you can easily um, check on numbers. And you can also have a lot of indirect impact uh, that comes out of it. Basically, for instance, what I just was mentioning with the foundation of this game development studio in Yemen, Arcadia Studio. Um, sometimes you have unintended reactions and follow up events, but it, that doesn't mean that you should not be aware of that and integrate them into your impact measurement. Yeah? Also, with the first hackathon that we did in Ethiopia, for instance, um, there were some follow up, up events that some of our participants, they conducted in their home countries when they went back to the different countries all over Africa, they conducted these events also um, without us uh, knowing it at the very beginning. But these, these indirect impacts that you have that you need to also take into consideration uh, for the evaluation, of course. And, you know, on all the social media platforms, you need to have an open eye to see uh, what is the uh, response. And here's like a, a question that guides over then also to the discussion. And um, we have awareness, uh, we have learning, we have awareness raising and behavior change. And I get often the question, how do you measure behavior change? And this is probably the holy grail of gamification and serious games still. The awareness raising, yes, this is um, this is one possibility that I gave you with the real life challenges. At least this is something where you get a hint of awareness raising. But real behavior change will not happen just because you played a game once or you went through one of the systems of the gamified systems. You know, you need a lot of uh, a mixture, a composition of different interactions, and this needs you know, you need to do these things over time. So it's not, you know, you do one intervention and then you have a behavior change of the whole society. No, this is not how it works. You need to have like different steps to trigger this kind of behavior change or to invite people for behavior change. Yeah, You cannot force people for behavior change. Yes, you can, but uh, I think we all agree that you shouldn't do that. But you can only with these aspects, you can invite people for a behavior change, but this consists of different um, interventions, not only by playing one game. There are a lot of different aspects, the social environment, the use case, you know, the culture, the target group, all these things that I talked about also in the context Zoom are important for that. And yeah, that's it from my side. First of all, I want to thank you very much. Um, for yeah, following me hopefully <laughs> in the last 60 minutes. And I would love to now uh, also, yeah, get your voices and uh, your questions and trying to get into the discussion. Thank you very much.